Welcome to this edition of Baseball Essential. My name is Gershon Rafinowitz. I'm joined by a very special guest, actually a colleague at Baseball Essential, believe it or not, who has written a book at the age of 15 years old, Matt Nadell. And he's been on the show before, and it's an honor to have you on once again. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Gershon. Growing up in Springfield, New Jersey, how did you become captivated in the game of baseball? Um, so I grew up a Yankee fan. And I wanted to learn a little more about the history of the Yankees. So I started reading biographies in some of the famous New York Yankees, like Dave Ruth, Lou Gehrig, John Maggio, Mickey Mantle. And from those books, I got a lot of more names, like Walter Johnson, Hank Aaron, Willie Mays. And then eventually, I started knowing all of these names that uh, I became so infatuated with not only the history of the game, but because of me knowing the history of the game, I got more infatuated with the current stage of baseball and what's happening now. So, and it all it all basically culminated with the Yankees won the 2009 World Series, and then I really became a really hardcore baseball fan. Yeah, and the, the Yankees' history, 27 World Championships, just some of the names that they have, countless names, countless retired numbers. It's really remarkable the history that they do have. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I think they have about maybe 40 Hall of Famers who played for the club somewhere around there. Uh, just a great franchise, great uh, great players, great managers. Over uh, 40 uh, pennants won, and yeah, like you said, 27 World Series championships. Just a great franchise, and honestly, I love being a Yankee fan. Even though they're not doing so well right now, I mean, for Yankee standards, uh, no offense any uh, anyone, <laughs> any other fan, but uh, the Yankees are just a great franchise, and I love rooting for them, and I love being part of their fan base. As you became interested in baseball, you started on MLB blogs with Baseball with Matt in 2012. At the time, you were the youngest pro blogger. What made you decide to start your blog, and when did you notice that you were developing such a large following? Um, so I started the blog because I realized that kids at my school really didn't know a lot about baseball history. I, I could talk to them about, about current baseball, but as soon as I mentioned stuff in the past, they all just look very bewildered. And I thought to myself, well, why not I just make a blog about it? So I started a blog in April 2012. I became an official MLB Pro blogger in October of 2012. And uh, I didn't know that I would get such such a nice following. It's been it's been really awesome teaching everyone about baseball history. I, I couldn't be more thrilled. During your young career, you have interviewed a number of prominent baseball personalities, Jim Palmer, Jim Leyritz, Mickey Wilson. If there was one person you could interview, who would it be and why? I actually want to interview a lot of people, but I'll tell you the person who I really want to interview the most. I would say Mike Schmidt, the former third baseman of the Philadelphia Phillies. He happens to be my my favorite baseball player in all of baseball history because he was such a good fielder and a great power hitter. Also, I love his mustache. Yeah, he Arguably, he might be one of the greatest third basemen of all time. Oh, of course. There are not, there are not that many Hall of Fame third basemen. When you look at position, not at all. Yeah, no, I mean, with the Yankees, when we mentioned about the Yankees, Greg Nettles is the only is the only other third baseman besides Alex Rodriguez that I could think of that had a prominent impact there. And then when you look at baseball, George Brett, as you mentioned in your book, he never even hit 30 home runs, which was really surprising. When we talk about your book, we'll get into that. You know, Mike Michael Jack Schmidt, I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about Brooks Robinson, recent years, Chipper Jones, if he makes the Hall of Fame, maybe Adrian Beltre, some people have talked about. But the hot corner has not had that many Hall of Famers. Yeah, and it's weird because currently uh, a lot of people consider the third base position to be the power position, the guys who hit the home runs, as well as first base. But really, all the home run hitters are, have been in the outfield. Uh, excuse me, have been in the outfield. Hank Aaron, Willie Mays, Babe Ruth, I'm trying to think of others, Mickey Mantle, Reggie Jackson, all of them were outfielders. Sam Usual, uh, with, uh, Ted Williams. Call Yastrzemski, all outfielders. You would think third base is the power, the power place, but not really. Yeah, I mean it's really, it's really the outfield. Also, first base. You have a lot of first base and Lou Gehrig, of course, that come to mind that are you know power positions. But third base, for some reason, just hasn't been with the Hall of Fame as much. In addition to and, interviewing Hall of Famers and big leaguers, you interviewed two former presidents, George Bush Jr. and George Bush Sr. What did it mean to you to have the opportunity to speak to two highly regarded individuals who led our country? Oh, I feel so honored. Uh, I, I couldn't have gotten those interviews without the help of my dad and his client, who happens to be George Bush Jr.'s brother, Marvin Bush. Uh, it, it was 
it was such an honor really to interview them and I'm I'm so thankful that I have their interviews on my blogs. So if you want to go check them out. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. I mean, I'm just trying to think like going you know, trying to interview a president, what's going through your mind and just what goes into that when you're interviewing an elected official? In that case, are you in the same room with them, or are you, or are you sending them questions through email? How exactly does the process work? Uh, well, I actually uh, the interviews were done over email, but the the process of coming up with the questions was me looking them up, and I knew they had baseball backgrounds. George mm-hmm. Bush Senior played in the first two College World Series, and George Bush Junior owned the Tex uh, not the Texans the Texas Rangers. So I I knew what I could talk about. I also wanted to talk about their just their lives in general. For example, George W. George H. W. Bush uh, uh, was shot down in in mid flight during World War II. So I wanted to mention that uh, George Bush uh, George Bush Jr. Obviously, he was a lot involved a lot with the 9/11 attacks. So I wanted to talk mm-hmm. about that. Uh, coming up with questions, it was very interesting. Uh, I came up with a couple creative ones. For example, for George H. W. Bush, I said. Which Hall of uh, not which Hall of Fame president? Which president would fare best playing baseball? And H. W. Bush ha- answered Abe Lincoln because of his work with an axe. <laughs> so I like I like to I wanted to come up with with very influ not influential but very important questions to address as well as fun questions and baseball related questions because you have to remember this is a baseball interview. I mean I am talking to them about baseball. But then I also have to remember their presidency of the United States. So there are there is a lot to talk about about the political about the political side of things. And then I also wanted to talk about just their lives in general. So the question process was very uh, interesting, and I got great answers back. So it, it was it was it was great. I I really enjoyed it. Do you see yourself pursuing a career in baseball as you grow up? And if you do, what role in baseball? Well, considering I'm I'm fairly young in the high school, uh, in high school I'm only a sophomore. I haven't really been thinking about what I wanted to do in college uh, and what, what I want to study. Uh, I would I would love to be involved with baseball. Anything in baseball, whether it be a baseball historian, a baseball journalist, maybe even a baseball broadcaster, or a baseball agent. I really just want to stay involved with the game because it's such a great game, and I and I feel like that I it would be so fun to just st- stay involved with it. Definitely is. I mean, all everybody here wants to pursue that, wants to be involved in the game somehow because the game is just so rewarding and what it could bring. Exactly. Recently, yeah, recently you wrote your first book entitled Amazing Errands to Zero Zippers. When did the opportunity present itself? And could you describe for us the process of getting a book published? Okay, so first I'll talk about how I got the book, how I, how I how I contacted Summer Game Books, and how that all came about. So after I'd written about 50 posts, uh, I started copying the posts on my main blog, basewithmatablogspot.com, into a Word document to maybe turn it into a book one day. Uh, when I got to about 100 posts, I decided to just write a manuscript for a book instead. So since I loved the A to Z alphabet books as a kid that I always used to read with my parents and grandparents, I thought that it would be a great format for a baseball history introduction book. So I wrote the first draft of the book in 2013 with that format over about, I would say, three months. So after a bunch of edits, uh, me and my dad, we were unable to find uh, any interest in publishing, which, yeah, it was bad at first. But luckily, earlier this year, so that would be 2014, Mike Lynch, who is one of the writers for Scene Heads, had a had a has a friend named Walter Freeman who is the head publisher at Summer Game Books, which is a publishing company located in New Jersey, that was looking for authors. So I just happened to have this manuscript. So I passed it over to him and over a six month period we started editing book and now it's an e book and it'll be coming out as a paperback uh, in spring training. That's like an amazing journey just to be able to write a book, especially at that age. There's so many people that try to write a book or have an idea for it, prominent journalists, and then they get denied by a publishing company. But to be able to just do that at such a young age and have it published and then, you know, it's pretty remarkable. Yeah, thank you so much. And and the process, by the way, I just want to answer the second part of the question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so it, it went through a lot of edits, yes, and I did have to do a lot of revision. But ultimately, as, as I realized that, when I did the revisions, the book was so much better. 
like editing is such an important process in the publishing in the in publishing a book that if I didn't do those edits, my book would be total mishmash. It it would really it would really be kind of like choppy and just not great. The wording wouldn't be good. But because of the edits, and now that I know what had to be changed, now now I realize how 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 influential editing is. And uh, also, I wanted to get a good uh, uh, someone who really knows the game of baseball to write a forward for the book. So mm-hmm. I ended uh, I talked to Jim Palmer, who you said I previously interviewed, and mm-hmm. he actually ended up writing the forward for the book, which I am so thankful for. I cannot thank him enough. So yeah. It was it was such a wild ride, and I'm so happy that the book is out right now. Speaking of the book, what sources did did you rely on for your research, and what did you discover as far as intriguing facts that you weren't familiar with? Uh, um, I used a lot of sources, whether it be just like stats, like Baseball Reference, to like the hall like the Hall of Fame website, and I also used a lot of books. Uh, but some of the information I didn't really know. I didn't know a lot about the uniforms, about the history of uniforms, uh, which is in the zero zippers section of the book because besides the the pants zipper there were no zippers on the baseball uniform currently there used to be on the on the actual jersey but there aren't any more uh so yeah uniforms was very fun to research i also had a lot of fun researching the extra inning games because mm-hmm. uh for to me an extra inning game is so exciting it especially if it goes like if it's like 14 14 after like 16 innings after the the player's Keep, uh, excuse me, the teams keep on scoring one after another. So the extra innings is very fun to research. And just, I, everything was really fun to research, but I guess I guess the extra innings and the uh, the uniforms I really didn't know about. So I, I was learning new things while writing the book, and I'm sure everyone can learn something from the book. I, I, I hope I did enough research, and I hope that everyone can get something out of it. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, I I learned a lot with the uniforms. With, also with Lou Gehrig, I had no idea that he was a fullback. That he was gonna there was actually a fullback at Columbia. And oh yeah, yeah. A football career. So I guess if Wally, I guess if Wally Pip doesn't suffer that headache, maybe, maybe he leaves the Yankees. Maybe he plays in the NFL at the time. Oh uh, yeah, could have been uh, the next Jim Thorpe. And you mentioned about like, the uniforms. I remember seeing photos of the Cardinals. I think from the 40s and 50s where they have that zipper uniform. I think Red Schoenheis had that on. Enos Slaughter, Stan Musial. So they had that, the Cardinals, same birds on the back side. And then you have also those, those odd uniforms like the Astros rainbow ones, the White Sox with the shorts, the Ray Kroc ones, the McDonald's owner with the San Diego Padres in the late 70s. And that was around the time when they also, I think, went to the double knit jersey. So the jersey you know, was a lot more breathable fabric. It wasn't that old wool fabric. And it seems like now in baseball, they, they experimented a little bit in the 1990s with some of these out, outlandish jerseys. And it seems like now they're really trying to go back to that traditional uniform. Each team seems to try to be going back to that roots and almost in a throwback style. Uh, yeah, the Orioles just went back to their throwback uniforms just a couple seasons ago. The Astros are kind of they're kind of going back to their, their throwbacks, not really, but like the color scheme is different. To me, I love throwbacks. I mean, obviously, teams like the Yankees and the Cubs can't really do throwbacks because their 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 uh, uniforms have kind of been altered just a little bit. Mm-hmm. So if you go back to the way the way back, like the ni- early 1910s, for example, then then yeah, it would be cool. But I like, but for the Yankees and the Cubs, they have cool uniforms. But throwbacks are so awesome. Like if you, I love the Angels throwbacks, the powder blue. Uh, speaking of Outer Blue, the Milwaukee Brewers and the Atlanta Braves have great throwbacks. Uh, just throwbacks to me, I, I I collect throwback hats actually, and I mean I don't want to insult the uniforms now, but I love throwbacks a lot more than the current uniforms, just because I love I love uh, the history, so I I know how significant the uniforms are, and then what they when they were when they were worn at specific times in famous moments in baseball history. So it's cool to, let's say, look at the uh, the Pirates hat that kind of looks like a, you're wearing a conductor's hat on a train and say, hey, those 1979 Pirates with Willie Sarger were pretty good. So, yeah, yeah throwbacks to me are, are really fun. fun. But uh, ultimately, the, the, colorful, the more colorful and creative a uniform is, the better, that, according to me. That's what I think. 
Well, I think that's also important to the Miami Marlins after they changed their uniforms in 2012 and they went to so many different colors. It's even hard to describe for the Mets who have tons of different uniforms, even though they went back to a throwback look. Now, the game of baseball is divided into a number of different eras. Do you have a particular preference in which era you like the best? And do you think the game was better in previous eras as opposed to today? Okay, so I'm going to combine this question into one just because my answer for both is the same. The 1950s, the ni- like the 1940s, 50s, and 60s were the best times in baseball history for a couple of reasons. One, Yankees were winning pennant after pennant. That's, for me, that's why I like, the, like that the best because Mickey Mandel, Joe DiMaggio, and Yogi Berra were just kind of tearing up the American League. Secondly, there were a lot of really famous moments in the, in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. For example, uh, for example, you know, Slaughter's Mad Dash, Willie Mays' The Catch, as well as Jackie Robinson's Stealing Home in the 1955 World Series. You had Sandy Koufax in the 60s not playing on Yom Kippur. Uh, just, just a bunch of really great moments happened in the 50s, as well as basically every single year a New York team was in the World Series. Uh, and then, of course, the Dodgers and Giants moved to San Francisco and Los Angeles in 1957, I think. Yeah, after the yeah. 1957 season. But, uh, yeah, it was it was an exciting time. Power hitters everywhere. Pitchers were great. Of course, as you move, as you move into the late 60s, you get into the year of the pitcher with Bob Gibson, who had a 1.12 ERA, which is absolutely insane. But the fit, the, four, the late 40s, 50s, and early 60s were probably the best time for baseball because of the production of the players. There were a lot of Hall of Famers from that era, and the fan bases were huge. So I, I love that era the most. Yeah, I have to agree with that because also something that you didn't mention about baseball experienced the most change between the 1940s and the 1970s. You first had African American players starting with Jackie Robinson playing. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention yeah. that. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah Jackie you, Robinson you, broke the color barrier in yeah. '47. Yeah, and you had 16 teams. They were, you know, eight in eight in each league. They were. They didn't have any teams out west. The Dodgers were the first team that wanted to move out west. The Giants actually wanted to move to Minnesota. There oh are wow, one. I didn't yeah. actually know that. Yeah. Yeah, Horace Stroman oh. wanted to move the team to Minnesota, and then when the Dodgers decided to move to Los Angeles. They the Giants wanted to go to with them. them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They needed the, the rivalry. Giants. Yeah, to keep the rivalry going, also to keep you know teams going to the West Coast. They were not, they were not going to be willing to go to the West Coast for one team. And then you started to see in 1961 some expansion. You had the, the Washington Senators coming back. And, yeah, the and Los Angeles back. Angels yeah. came, and then the yeah. Mets. And then the yeah, Colt 45s. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, the Colt 45s and came the Houston Astros and. Also, it was around the time in the late 60s when we started having the players have, you know, start the Players Association. Free agency was about 10 years away. Marvin oh, Miller yeah. helped them establish their rights, and then they were able to get free agency, and that really transcended the game. So I look yeah. at that era, everybody, everybody calls it the golden era of baseball, and yes, it is probably the greatest era of baseball. But let's go exactly. back now to today. Uh, let, let's look at the current times in baseball. If you were the commissioner of baseball today, would there be anything you would change about the game? Um, I want to make I want to somehow make the game slower. Now I'm not saying I want to cut it off after three hours. I'm saying that you know maybe maybe less time in between pitches, maybe less time in between half innings, just to slow the game down. Because one of the reasons that baseball is kind of losing its popularity is because the fans are getting bored of watching three and a half hour games. So if you if you shorten the games, that means that there's more excitement per minute. If you if you understand what I'm saying with the yeah. with the whole ratio, mm-hmm. I'm also thinking about baseball history when you have these players and these games that would be about maybe two hours and ten minutes, two hours twenty minutes. I, I exactly. remember seeing the 1956 Don Larson perfect game when that was on MLB Network. He never stepped off the mound. The, the batters never stepped out of the box. Oh yeah. It, it, so it would be it would be a very brisk pace, and that's what I would really like to see. Guys, not not leave the batter's box and pitchers not step off the mound. Yeah, at the same time, you do have to think. Mm-hmm. You know, it is it is a little more technical game right now. You do yeah. you do have a lot more coaches giving you a lot more signs. So, but I I do I do say that yes, the game has to be 
uh, slowed down, or not slowed down, sped up, excuse me, so that the fans don't get bored and then either leave the stadium or turn off the television or turn off the radio, depending on how you're getting the information about the game. But, uh, yeah, just speed up the game. That, that's really the big, the big issue right now. Or if you're watching the game on your phone or your tablet these days, as a baseball historian, how do you evaluate the steroid error, and do you think a player suspected of performance-enhancing drug use in their playing career should be in the Hall of Fame? Ooh, so, oh, so, tough question. So, I don't like players who use steroids. I'm not a big Barry Bonds, Sammy Sosa, Mark McGuire guy. Uh, but here's the thing. If they didn't, if they weren't tested positive, then I think they should be in the Hall of Fame. Otherwise, they should not. For example, Jeff Bagwell and Mike Piazza both have been in the Hall of Fame medal for the past couple of years and both have not gotten in, which is absurd to me. I really don't understand why, because they never were tested positive. Yes, there were speculations, but it's a medical thing. If you're not tested positive, I don't, I don't really think you have, you have taken the drug. And on the subject of being banned from baseball, uh, the Pete Rose is is a big co- is a big controversial topic in baseball whether he should be in the Hall of Fame or not. My opinion is he'll be in the Hall of Fame as soon as he passes away. Yeah, I, I could see maybe even under Rob Manfred as the commissioner of baseball, I could see maybe maybe Pete Rose getting reinstated and then eligible for the Hall of Fame and getting into the Hall of Fame. I think with Austin yeah. Hart, you mentioned about players not never being. And I'm never testing positive for performance enhancing drugs. A lot of those guys were playing before there was any steroid testing. Steroid testing happened in 2003, so it's really it's really hard to tell. And also, there's one other aspect that some some people go by that for a guy like Barry Bonds, that from 19, from 1986 to 1998, before he start, before he was suspected of stirring the juice, he was gonna he was gonna be a Hall of Fame player anyway. Do you judge do you judge a guy like Bonds or Roger Clemens solely on those years before they were suspected of, of cheating, or even Alex Rodriguez, do you put them in the Hall of Fame based on those years and exclude the years that follow? I don't put them in the Hall of Fame at all, and I'll tell you why. Because if you use steroids, whether it be in the beginning, the middle, or the end of your career, you are cheating. And cheating, to me, should not be allowed in baseball or in baseball history. So if you cheat in any way possible, and I'm looking at George Brett with the Pine Tower game. No, I'm just kidding. I, I think that uh, George got that home run right. But uh, if you cheat with performance enhancing drugs or somehow you you manage to get your bat uh, a little more spring on the ball than usual and you start hitting 70 homers a season, then you should not be in the Hall of Fame. I mean, some people would say, like, somebody like Gaylord Perry or Don Sutton, who used to scuff, both of them used to scuff the baseball. And they're both in the Hall of Fame because there was always always forms of cheating, always guys trying to gain an edge. So it's just such a controversial topic, and it just has you know so many layers to it. But in the last 25 years, the game of baseball we talked about a little bit has taken a nosedive in popularity. The average age of a World Series viewer is over the age of 50 as the ratings settle behind the NBA Finals and the Super Bowl. Why is oh, wow. baseball not relevant as it once was, and what can be done? to reverse the trend? Well, it's a couple reasons. One, the PEDs. That's definitely one thing. You know, people don't want to watch just big guys constantly hit home runs. They want Sometimes they want a pitcher's duel. Sometimes they want a slugfest. But they don't want a slugfest every day. Other And another reason is definitely just the, the game. It's too slow. The, the fans, they, they, don't, they don't want a slow game. I don't want a slow game. Sometimes I have to switch between uh, in in between commercials, when when baseball is in a commercial to another channel, uh, because the game is just slow. It really needs to be sped up. I think once it gets sped up, then the fans will start trickling in very slowly at first, and then probably it will you know a total uh, outpour of fans entering let's say I don't know the 2030s. Because this is going to be a long process to get back to where it, for baseball to get back to where it was. Because I mean, it's it's dug itself a hole. It's just got to get out of it. I think a couple of issues with, with with attendance and just with ratings issues, why it's happening in baseball. I would say also that baseball has difficulty marketing their stars. Unless unless you're really a strict baseball fan, many casual fans don't they'll know who LeBron James is. They'll know who Kobe Bryant is. They won't know who 
Clayton Kershaw is or Mike Trout or even heard of Pablo Sandoval or James Shields. And the game mostly markets to the bigger markets, the Yankees and the Red Sox over the last couple of years. And I think one thing that I also hurt is in the old days, 70s, 80s, NBC used to have the Saturday game of the week, which was the only game that somebody could watch on TV featuring players and teams outside their local markets. Now you have MLB.tv, you have extra innings, you have all these games, you got local games, you got Sports Center, MLB Network. There's so many games on, and it seemed like the game of the week, which you don't see as much anymore on Fox now, it seems like it just doesn't have the same relevance it once did. It's not like every game is an event anymore because you have 162 games. And I guess the casual fan may think that the product is watered down because there's so many games and it's so hard to keep up as opposed to, let's say, watching the NFL. Yeah, but I, I would have to, I would, I do have to agree with you. However, baseball is still baseball. It's always going to have that history. So, in my opinion, as long as young fans can really get into the history of the game, which is what I'm trying to do, then they will, then they will love the, the current baseball. Because, in my opinion, you got to know the past in order to know the present, in order to be aware of the future. And, and speaking of that past. There seems to be less awareness and an alarming apathy towards baseball history by younger fans. They, they seem to have just identify better with the current players as opposed to what happened in the past. Is there a reason why younger fans are disregarding the history of the game? Well, it's just because, like, like mentioned before, baseball is losing its popularity. So now young fans are getting driven to the NFL stars and the NBA stars. I mean, would you rather... Would, if you would ask a five-year-old, would you rather meet a guy like Reggie Jackson, who is who is not the nicest guy, compared to a guy, a sweet, sweet, seven over seven-foot-tall Shaquille O'Neal? If I was five years old, I would totally pick Shaquille O'Neal over a very surly Reggie Jackson. What, what I've noticed is, and, and this is a problem, like, even like if I talk to, to certain people about things that I've watched, I'll watch, I, I, I'm a student in the game, I watch a lot of old clips, old, old games, whatever it is, like, I was talking about different Game 7s, and I was mentioning about the Braves and the Twins, what was, you know, like a terrific series, worse than first in 91. It didn't seem like that many people were interested in, you know, hearing about Kirby Puckett and hearing about, you know, John Smoltz and Jack Morris, for instance. And then there, I, I know somebody that couldn't even name any commissioners besides Bud Seeley and I think Ford Frick. So it just seems like just, there's just so much apathy towards the history of the game and just failure to either understand it or failure to be interested in it. I don't know if you've noticed that as well. No, I definitely have. Of course, you know, the 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 history of the game is getting a little lost just because of fans not really being interested in the current stuff. So it, it's, it's, it's really bad. But you know what? As long as people keep on talking about the history, then it will never die down. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to make sure that as many people uh, as possible know about the history of America's pastime. Because, as, sorry, as far no, as no, I'm... Ahead, yeah. Okay. As far as I'm concerned, baseball will always be America's pastime. Maybe football will be America's game. But baseball will always be the game that you played as a young kid. Not everyone can play football as a young kid, but everyone can play baseball as a young kid, whether it be t-ball, softball, wiffle ball, or the game itself, baseball. And I think that that's really where baseball has to has to get back. I guess just little leagues and just inner cities getting kids seven, eight, nine, ten years old to be on the baseball field, learning the fundamentals, getting into the game. I think that also the talent pool a little bit is diluted these days because so many talented athletes are going to play basketball, football, even hockey is making tremendous strides in this country. So you're, you're losing so many different athletes. I walk by some baseball fields and you see them pretty much empty. And it's something that you didn't see even 15 years ago when I, when I started playing Little League. I'm noticing it a lot today, and it just seems like I don't know if it's – I don't know if it's because people can't afford the equipment. I don't know if it's just, just general disinterest in the game, but I think that that's where it really needs to start. Yeah, I think it's just general disinterest in the game. It, it really, it really does. It, it's not that exciting when not a lot of people want to play little league. And personally, I love playing little league. I had a lot of fun, although I'm not very good at playing baseball. It's it's a fun thing to do with a kid. Um, and I I really just want as I really just want kids to just go out and just play baseball. 
because it's such a fun sport and it's such a fun team building ex- exercise that there, there's no negatives around it. Yeah, it's it's just the, one of the best sports in the world. I mean, and, I mean, yeah, you yeah. gotta you gotta consider soccer because it's the most yeah. popular. But I mean, how do you not love baseball? Yeah. Uh, yes. Soccer, soccer is huge around around the country. I mean, around the world. I mean, Canada hockey is huge. We, I, I just mentioned about hockey. I mean, it's huge there. So many sports really trying to captivate the attention, and now everybody everybody has phones. You see this explosion of social media. That might also play into it as well. What hobbies do you have outside the game of baseball? Okay. Um, so I like to, I, I watch TV, play video games, and go on my computer a lot. Uh, but I do like assisting uh, the less fortunate. So I do uh, assist at my local special needs karate classes, usually on Tuesdays and or Saturdays. I've been doing that since I was in about sixth grade. Um, and I write for The Flame, which is the newspaper at my school. I'm one of the sports editors. Actually, I'm the head sports editor, and I also write articles. And uh, I am also a member of student council. So, yeah. <laughs> if somebody wanted to purchase your book, where could they go, and how can they approach that? Okay, so right now, my book is only an ebook, which means that it's only electronic. However, uh, come, come March or April, maybe, like around spring training, the book will come out in print. But for now, you can buy it on Amazon, uh, The Nook, which is Barnes & Noble, or iTunes, which is any Apple device. As, as you said, you have the book out. It's going to be on you know PDF, EPUB, for digital copies, and then it's coming out in spring training. It's called Amazing Aaron to Zero Zippers. You can purchase that book then. Matt Nadell, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. You can Follow him, Baseball with Matt, at Baseball W Matt on Twitter. He also contributes to Baseball Essential as well. So we'll definitely see you around, and we wish you the best. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to have spoken with you. Same here. Have a great night. All right, you too. Talk soon.